All right, welcome back to the last part of our video series on the Cordata. So you made it through uh, the early characteristics of what encompasses all mammals, uh, those four major characteristics that we talked about, uh, jawless fish, the agnathans, the, the evolution of jaws, to uh, our last video series on evolution of fishes. And we set up with the last class of uh, fishes, the low fin fishes, Sarcheoterygii, uh, to set us up on the evolution of tetrapods. So in this video, we're going to be looking at uh, amphibians through mammals and the characteristics of them. We're going to use the look at the exemplar of the frog's fantastic model on the anatomy and the physiology within tetrapods. So let's jump right into it and start with the amphibians. So amphibians give rise to, again, all other land vertebrates. So again, it's a very um, evolutionary, it's very nice because you can see that amphibian really means double life. Uh, if you've ever seen tadpoles in the water or anything like that, they have to start off in the water and then make this beautiful transition to the terrestrial environments. And as a consequence, as they transition to aquatic, to terrestrial, there has to be uh, these these adaptations that must have taken place or must take place so that they're able to survive and uh, overcome the forces of gravity uh, and things like that. Um, a water loss that if I'm totally living in an aquatic system that I don't have to necessarily overcome. So, uh, so adult species there again, one of those adaptations being lungs and to help with water loss and things like that and the, the breathing, uh, they also have a very had to have a lot of moisture on their skin. Now, some um, species of amphibians don't necessarily have to think of like your toads, for example, uh, but they've had other adaptations and other skin uh, uh, modifications that will allow them not to lose water. So, uh, the Devonian period there—that's kind of the uh, age of the amphibians. They are actually age of the fishes, but uh, really helped kind of. Uh, move set up the amphibians there and so as I was just talking about they had to have some way to keep from drying out as they move from this terrestrial environment uh, and so now that I'm not uh, looking for oxygen in the uh, water how can I get oxygen from the atmosphere so you have to have some type of a lung type thing which again the very last video we talked about those lung fishes those low fin fishes where uh, these fishes had already developed a right and a left lung, and that their gills had atrophied to the point of almost unused. Uh, so the bones in the limb have to allow for movement. And so we go from this pelvic fin area, right? So I'm basically sticking straight out here. And now I'm basically starting to see where my pelvic and pectoral girdles are starting to transition from straight lateral horizontal to more position to where I'm underneath. And in the frogs, we kind of see that they're not straight out and they're not completely underneath, but they're kind of in the hybrid and allows them to essentially do these little shows and help them jump, right? Um, ribs there to support and protect internal organs. So you didn't think about it. Uh, up until this point, there's really hasn't been a lot of talk or even uh, looking at the rib cage are surrounding the pleural and cardiac cavities. Um, but it's vitally important that these types of bone structures developed uh, to, again, to support the, those, those organs as also as a housing unit there. So we already talked about the, the novelty of going from a ventral nervous cord uh, like most animals to on our bats and dorsal nodal cord. And what that did was just allow uh, these these organisms or these organs, excuse me, and organ systems to kind of transfer around. And what that did was just create the cavity space uh, that we've talked about several times now for the ribs to protect the lungs and uh, the heart. So again, the carboniferous is really, um, so we go from the age of the fishes, the bony into the carboniferous, uh, so is where we set up this tetrapod, these early tetrapod uh, time. And so uh, very well-developed systems there, especially digestive. Again, beautiful, beautiful model 
um, when we dissect these frogs, mm -hmm. you will see just how remarkable uh, and I, uh, nearly identical in a lot of cases their digestive system is to ours. Uh, we'll look at this in this video. We'll look at um, their digestive organs and what they do. And I want you guys to know, again, what the organs are and what they do. Just because, again, it, it's just so similar to our digestive system. Uh, very developed lungs. You'll get to see that. Uh, closed circulation. They have a three-chambered heart. So mm -hmm. now we're going from a two-chambered heart to a three-chambered heart. And there's going to be some complications and some weird oddities in that uh, when we get to there. Uh, ammonium uh, is now disposed in the urine. So again, we're getting rid of metabolic waste. We talked about last video that osmoregulation. Uh, so we had to have some type of kidney-like structure. And in the fishes, we finally see a true kidney-like structure that's able to regulate uh, metabolic waste of ammonia, water, and salt. And so uh, we're going to continue with that theme there uh, in our tetrapod evolution. So most amphibians will lay their eggs in water uh, with fertilization being external. So again, very similar to fish in that they essentially will spawn. You may have seen this in pools or in little streams and, uh, and puddles and things where uh, there are frog eggs just everywhere. A male frog will come in uh, and then kind of spray and pray and hope that the sperm will fertilize the female's eggs there. Uh, not all amphibians uh, fertilize in this way, as you can see here. Some salamanders will actually fertilize internally, uh, which again is typically what we reserve to as a more highly evolved way of uh, introducing fertilization. But again, in most cases, it is external. Very little parental support uh, in that these eggs, again, are released simultaneously. They're going to be caps in this little jelly-like structure. Again, if you've ever felt these, are, it does feel exactly like uh, some type of little clear gelatin structure. It's kind of neat to, to kind of, you know, mess with if you're, if you're bored. Uh, the jelly nourishes the developing embryo. In this video, we'll also talk about uh, the importance of the nutrients and things in the egg that really helps set up uh, higher tetrapod evolution there. And then the tadpoles will hatch. And we've, we've already seen this word before. It looks like I misspelled it there. Uh, they're going to go through metamorphosis, and which means completely change from how they look as a larvae, as immatures, and into their adulthood. Um, so again, as I said, most cases, most frogs have little parental care, uh, but there are a few uh, that exhibit some weird characteristics, such as this frog here, uh, where their eggs are actually laid on their back and they can care for them there. But what's what's what is neat about that is you know if if you've seen, like I said, it's some in so much rain here this year uh, around here, is that you know puddles dry up. And if I'm a frog and I choose to lay my eggs in this puddle that may not hold water uh, for the duration that these tadpoles need, then these tadpoles will die. But if I'm able to uh, move my eggs after fertilization, I can kind of ensure uh, that when they're ready to hatch, that this puddle still has, or this body of water still has water in it. Uh, so again, uh, not a typical, uh, very, I should say very atypical uh, way of caring there uh, that we see in frogs, but it does happen. Um, very, very well developed brains and spinal cord. Again, similar to that of the uh, dogfish shark that you dissect in there. What's really neat is that they have this nictating membrane on their eyes. So they really have like, two sets of eyelids. Uh, and so, again, you may have seen uh, the, the movie Men in Black, the very first one when Will Smith's chasing the little guy at the beginning and that has one set of eyes and then he blinks another set of eyes. There are eyelids. Very similar concept here is that when these guys are underwater, they can flip their second pair of eyelids up and it's translucent or at least transparent enough that uh, that allows them to see underwater. So basically they have built-in goggles, which is just kind of crazy to think about, but really neat at the same time. So as they're swimming, they can flip this nictating membrane up and allow them to see out uh, as they're swimming around and foraging for food or whatever you have. Um, tympanic membrane, we've seen this before, especially in the um, in our grasshoppers and things like that. And so that's going to be on the side of their heads. And in very large frogs, even around here, uh, you can see that tympanic membrane really, really, really well. And that's just going to kind of be uh, again, for uh, auditory support there to help them hear. 
Uh, many of these uh, amphibians still possess that lateral line system that we talked about uh, last time. So that's going to allow them to sense uh, pressures and vibrations underwater, uh, which is really going to be really helpful, especially because uh, a lot of predatory fish uh, use small frogs and frog and other types of uh, amphibians as a good food source. So there are a couple of orders here. I don't really want you to get caught up in the orders of amphibians there, uh, but it is nice that uh, we have gone through and um, kind of, you know, as we always try to do, kind of put things in nice in the order. So all your salamanders and newts are in this Eurodela order there. Frogs and toads are in Nora, and then probably your lesser known, your Sicilians there are in the older order all by themselves. So they are legless, almost snake-like uh, creatures there. Uh, just some general characteristics of each there. Salamanders typically have longer bodies and tails. Uh, they are carnivores. They can bite you if they are big enough, and they can draw blood. Uh, from experience, they're uh, not a pretty uh, pleasant thing there. Uh, typically, your salamanders and newts have to be in uh, damp or um, swampy-like areas there. Uh, mud puppies in there I even have gills and things which uh, will help them live under water. Your frogs and toads, again, have the, the pectoral and pelvic girdles have kind of separated and moved a little bit more to allow them to do these types of push-ups. Um, so the longer legs on the back help them to jump. Jump. Uh, frogs are typically more closely associated with water because of this, their requirement that their skin still allows them to breathe, so we still have some diffusion of gases in the skin there. Where toads are more terrestrial, uh, in part because their skin is, has a lot more bumps and folds on it, which allows them to, trans, uh, to trap and help uh, conserve water, which is kind of a neat adaptation there. Uh, again, the Sicilians, less known there. They almost look like a giant worm or a little small snake there. Uh, some even have scales, which again, is very nice to think about because these are the closest living ancestors to fish, and most of your fish have scales. Uh, these are, again, carnivores. They're going to feed on small invertebrates like termites. Uh, they're going to be legless and burrow, again, typically in and around lakes and rivers and things like that in this moist soil um, area there. So, again, a lesser known amphibian, but still one of, of importance. Uh, just in general ecology there, uh, again, most a lot of animals uh, hired, uh, even some fishes and things, will try to eat these. Uh, to combat that, many of these uh, amphibians have developed toxins and uh, bright colors to kind of help warn other predators there. So like your poison dart frogs and things like that in the uh, in the rainforest areas. And then even some others have gone into um, some of this um, convergent uh, evolution type where they're mimicking these other poison frogs or other poison amphibians in that uh, it allows them allows them to kind of fool their predators and thinking, oh, this is that, but it's really not. So again, the better you are at mimicking a poison, individual poison population, the more likely you are to survive. And the whole purpose of, of life and biology speaking is just to survive, to reproduce. And so if I can survive and reproduce, my genes are passed on to my population. Mm. And uh, hence for uh, I to survive even if I die later on. So – uh, ecology here. So a couple things here that I'd want to bring your to your attention, just because they're happening now. So a lot of a lot of uh, uh, herpetologists uh, will actually say that the uh, we're actually undergoing the sixth great max mass extinction, uh, specifically in frogs. And so over the last thirty years, they are uh, a third of the uh, amphibian species have, have gone on the threatened list and over a hundred species have been lost in the last 30 years. I have just completely gone extinct. There's no remaining um, living exemplar of those species, which is just crazy to think about. Um, but also at the same time, you look at what we're doing and the way the population is growing and the way that um, we treat certain organisms and uh, habitats. Like I said, we're just, you know, we'll, we want to build them all. Well, there's a wetland. Let's get it out. Let's drain the swamp uh, and you know, build a build a mall, which is exactly what happened around in the uh, Germantown Mall area that used to be a wetland habitat. Um, they drained it, built the mall. Now you have Germantown 
uh, mine, and that area builds around what used to be a wetland habitat. Yes, uh, there. So again, decreasing habitat, water pollution is uh, absolutely uh, atrocious. There, a lot of these things that we're building, it's kind of a it's pros and cons, right? So we spray, or we don't have to spray as much, or we do spray for these mass uh, crops, but we want them to be water insoluble because we don't want them to, as soon as it rains, we lose that poison and we have to go back and spray. So we're, again, it's more cost effective, but the downside of it being water insoluble is now it's just going to do whatever uh, runoff does happen, gets into our lakes, rivers, and streams and oceans and doesn't really break down all that well. Um, and so one of the major things that's happening or major reasons why amphibians are dying is not necessarily because of humans per se, but it's because of a, uh, a fungus. And we talked about this in our fungal study early in the year. This chytrid, this particular type of fungus, feeds on the frog skin. So uh, Batrochytrum dendrobatidius, uh, which many people just refer to as BD, uh, as you can see why. Um, and so what this uh, fungus would do is just, again, little fungal spores here, will get on the frog or the toad skin, and it's going to start to gum it up and actually uh, invade it and spread its little um, mycelium things in the, inside the skin. And it's going to actually cause it to uh, gum up and allow, uh, not allow, I should say, your gases to exchange because it's going to begin to dry out the skin if the skin is dried out, much like a worm on a hot sunny afternoon of concrete, it will start to suffocate. Um, some work done at the University of Memphis labs there, uh, where I graduated from, they were doing a lot of work on this in their uh, one of their labs there. And to combat BD just kind of happened by mistake. Actually, uh, the Roundup actually killed this fungus, which is kind of neat to think about. Uh, another thing here that, that this uh, chytrid would do BD is be doing tadpoles is actually it messes up the morphology of the tadpole's teeth and jawline so that the tadpole can't eat. And so uh, what's interesting enough is that the Roundup will kill this and allow the tadpole's um, you know, jaws and, and, and teeth not to be messed up. However, you're introducing Roundup into the system. Now you're killing off plants and things like that. So again, uh, you know, it's kind of the, the woman who swallowed the fly, who swallowed the cat, who swallowed the frog, frog type thing. When we get rid of one, we introduce one thing to solve one problem, which then that that uh, answer then becomes another problem. So uh, this domino effect that we tend to have a lot. Uh, so again, just to kind of give you some numbers and impact on this BD that, again, a lot of people don't know about, is that uh, some recent numbers here. 501 amphibian species, so about one out of every 16 uh, of these populations have uh, gone and declined because of this fungus infestation, with over 90 uh, species being attributed to this extinction. So again, imagine how uh, you know horrifying this would be if you're you know, seeing this mountain, seeing snow, you think, oh, it's pretty fresh water. But then you look and you see all these dead frogs, you go, oh my gosh, something's poisoned the water. It's not really the, that the water's been poisoned. It's that these frogs can't breathe. These amphibians can't breathe because of BD. So, again, uh, I just want, want you to be aware of that. But this is ongoing. Uh, and, again, it's not too late uh, for us to kind of help these amphibians. But, again, we just need to be more aware of it and uh, in the public perception, public awareness. Uh, now, let's look at the anatomy here. And So the reason why we use models is because, again, we can't necessarily dissect at the high school level and even at uh, your JUCO and, you know, introductory and uh, biology major classes. You don't have access. Most schools don't have access to a human cadaver. And so we can't look and look in necessarily at a human cadaver would be great, but we don't have access to that. So we use uh, models that represent close affinity to what we're trying to study. Uh, and, and we've talked about models a lot, evolution with bacteria, so because of generation time. So we're familiar with the concept of models. Uh, but again, I just want to, under, don't, don't, just want to understate uh, the importance of using the frog. A lot of people think, oh, great, I'm just dissecting the frog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's actually there's a point to it. Uh, and it's incredible, the remarkable homology 
between us and a frog. And so let's kind of look at it here. And this is the respiratory system alone here. So again, the purpose of the respiratory system is just to exchange gases. I don't like to say breathing because people tend to think breathing just strictly means with lungs. Uh, and so I want to push that envelope a little bit and say exchanging of gases here. And so the major structures involved in this respiratory system, just like in us, is a mouth, a trachea, that windpipe, and then we have two lungs, just like they do, uh, a left and a right. And so just, again, remarkable there. Um, the circulatory system, the cardiovascular system, again, we're going to uh, exchange oxygenated blood with deoxygenated blood, uh, and it's in a closed system uh, with the heart pumping through a series of arteries and veins. And so remember, this is a three-chamber heart. Okay, so we have uh, atriums, uh, right and left, and the ventricle down below, just like in us. The ventricle is the major, the bigger part of the heart, with atrium being here, but in between, or in the top portion there. Uh, the atrium is a smaller muscle in the ventricle, because the ventricle is going to pump and go throughout the entire body. It's systemic. Uh, but it's a little weird in that it has three chambers. And so now when this atrium pumps, right atrium pumps, oxygen, poor blood, the right atrium is they're going to pump. Uh, the pulmonary veins go to the lungs. So we're going to pump into this ventricle here. And the ventricle is going to pump. And now we have what we have is really neat. We have oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood in the same ventricle. And so you can kind of see where the uh, the need, if you will, for a septum or a dividing factor to separate this ventricle would derive to have make a four chamber heart because now this would solve the issue of deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood in the same chamber. So when this right atrium pumps, the ventricle is going to contract and it's going to send deoxygenated blood to the lungs. That the, from the lungs, it's going to come back, enter into the left atrium, right? Now it's oxygenated, going to the left ventricle here. It's going to pump and send that blood to the body. Um, and I can't really tell from what I found, uh, from my readings and things like that, I don't know how the frog is able to separate deoxygenated blood from oxygenated blood. So I feel like this is why, again, the importance of the frog being able to breathe through its skin because if it pumps deoxygenated blood from its from its um, ventricle to the body but it has on contact with a surface layer of the skin, it's going to be able to pick up some oxygenated blood, which is, again, just going to help with the uh, cell respiration process and for the, the ability to create 36 ATP. So again, you want to know just the pathway of the blood. It's very similar to our heart. So again, right atrium, deoxygenated blood goes to the ventricle. Uh, the ventricle is going to pump blood, deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Let's go from the lungs into the left atrium. Left atrium is going to pump. And then for the left ventricle and the ventricle, is again, it's going to pump blood to the body. Now what's really neat about the uh, circulatory system is there's a series of uh, hormones and also uh, uh, nervous tissue uh, that's going to regulate this heart. So again, we've all seen a scary movie or gotten scared. Hormones are pumping in. Our heart just starts to beat really, really quickly. Um, but there are also nervous tissue like the SA node and the, essentially like your pacemaker that's going to keep your heart rate at a certain level uh, when we are de-stressed or things like that, right? Um, and so uh, again, just kind of a neat little idea. And what's interesting and heart transplants patients, I'm, I'm diving just a little bit here, but heart transplants patients, we can't at this moment in time uh, reconnect the patient's nervous tissue. So we have to introduce a pacemaker, right? Uh, and that pacemaker helps kind of help regulate there. But a heart transplants patient's resting heartbeat is like 90 to 95, 96, the, regardless of physical fitness trait. Um, in typical... Uh, adults, uh, the resting heart rate varies from 60 to 75. And so the nervous tissue and the SA nodes uh, are what is keeping the heart at a lower uh, beats per minute than in our heart transplants. And so because they're missing that nervous input, just an interesting tidbit there for you. All right, so again, just the cardiovascular system, again, just the whole process of it, uh, just the drawing there. I'm not going to uh, expect you to know uh, 
the veins and arteries and things. I do want you to know right, left atrium and ventricle there uh, for the sake of the frog, but I mean, it's, it's pretty simplistic. Uh, the functions of the frog there. So again, we have a heart, three chambers there. This again is on your hot sheet there. Um, the major veins there, anterior, posterior. So again, posterior toward the head, anterior toward uh, the lower body there. So this is the major vein uh, that's carrying blood away or towards the heart. The sinus there, again, sinus is just the opening. Uh, Santa receives blood from the major vena cava. Right atrium, left atrium, pulmonary veins. Uh, blood vessels is carrying bloods from the lungs to the left atrium, right? So we're from the left atrium, so lungs back to the heart. Uh, so veins don't necessarily, uh, oh, I'll get away from that. Uh, the ventricle there, and then trunk is a, uh, arter arter arteriosis, excuse me, is a large artery in the frog that carries blood away from the ventricle. Uh, so that's basically what will become like all right or if you're familiar with that terminology there now one of my favorite parts is the digestive system so again this is just a fantastic diagram on model of the digestive system uh, and so again we've uh, we've got a three lobe liver here uh, gallbladder pancreas oh excuse me lung there pancreas is down below uh, we have the intestine stomach uh, we even have the duodenum the duodenum is the very first part of the intestine, just like in us, and it's going to secrete calcium bicarbonate, or essentially a compound like baking soda. It's going to help reduce the acidity coming directly out of the stomach. That way our intestines don't just have holes in it and we get septic and die. Uh, pretty crazy. Uh, large intestines, the colon there, may even have a urinary bladder when you dissect this frog here. Uh, when you cut from the... Uh, pelvic girdle here up to the and through the pectoral girdle uh, if you don't puncture too deep with your scissors uh, you will actually be able to see the urinary bladder there a very important structure fat bodies we're going to be covering all of this largely large important we'll talk about why we need fat in a few minutes and so you'll want to know what each major organ does in the organs in the digestive system so we know it's start the stomach is just there to kind of the storage there it's going to begin to mix some of the enzymes that we've made from our mouth and in our stomach, that pepsin that's going to break down our uh, proteins. And so proteins only get broken down in the stomach. Uh, so again, after eating a heavy meat-rich meal and you have indigestion, the worst thing you can do as far as uh, enzymatically and digestively is actually to take a ton or anything like that uh, to reduce the stomach acid because that's going to reduce the ability of your stomach to digest the meat. Um, so you just be aware of that. Small intestines, again, is where most of your absorption is going to be going because of the lots and lots of microvilleus and increased surface area. Duodenum, we just talked about uh, there as again the first part of the small intestine. Uh, it looks like it's a little bit more engorged, a little bit fatter. Uh, then the uh, small intestines there. The pancreas is the master digestive gland, going to excrete copious amounts of different types of digestive glands uh, or digestive enzymes, which will enter into the duodenum and again uh, into the small intestine to help digest carbs and fats and things like that. The gallbladder uh, stores bile, it does not make bile. Okay, and so what bile does is bile is an enzyme or a chemical that's going to digest fat. And so if, any, if you know anyone who's had their gallbladder removed, uh, they can still eat a fatty hamburger or french fries, but they can't eat too much or too fast because then they, you, they'll kind of tell you, oh, look, I'm, I'm a little sick, right? Uh, and because the gallbladder is what's storing the bile, the liver is what's making the bile. So they didn't get their liver removed. They got their gallbladder removed. And so the liver is only able to make uh, by own hand, uh, as you know, in that moment, but the gallbladder is important because again, it's the one storing it. Large intestine, uh, is really the main part where water is being removed, and any undigested solid food is going to be uh, removed. Uh, so, we talked about the liver, urinary bladder, honestly, this little transitional epithelial cells are going to help expand and contract and uh, hold on to metabolic uh, fluids. Fat bodies, vitally, vitally important. Uh, I can't underestimate um, the importance of fat. And really and truly, in this day and time, we tend to think 
excuse me, that fat is bad. I was like, oh, fat's ugly, fat's bad. Uh, fat is so important um, to the evolution of tetrapods. Without, without fat, we wouldn't be here. It's just that simple because there is more, uh, just think about what is what is the purpose of fat. You know, we have to, maybe I have to go back to our macromolecule discussion, but think about it. What is the purpose of fat? Fat is just energy and it's long-term energy. And so uh, our bodies are able to, you know, we eat a Snickers bar or whatever, we're able to digest that carbohydrate, turn it into uh, glycogen and glucose. But after about a day uh, or less than a day, depending on what we're, uh, what we're doing, then all of a sudden the glycogen reserves are gone. And so then we have to start pulling from our fat reserves. So think about from this evolutionary aspect, if fat didn't exist, our lifestyles wouldn't exist. Animals really wouldn't exist either because we can't sit there and photosynthesize and get energy just from nothing. We have to eat. And if we didn't have fat bodies, either we were metabolism would have to be really, really slow or just kind of filter feeders where we're always eating, essentially. Um, or uh, our, our metabolism would have to be so slow that when we do eat, we're able to kind of just hold on to any reserves, which means we probably wouldn't have a lot of movement and life would still kind of be centered really, really close to water and not in the water. Uh, so again, I cannot underestimate the importance of fat and the tetrapod evolution. Uh, the spleen there, again, that's what's going to um, recycle damaged red blood cells and things like that. The cloaca is the product there, the frog's digestive and urogenital systems. Uh, so it's basically a, uh, a, an opening for solid, uh, solid foods and also uh, the genital system. So it's kind of weird that they don't have a separate urethra uh, and, uh, uh, and genitalia basically. So again, here's the, uh, reproductive system. And so when you open up this frog, you'll be able to tell right away if it's male or female. You can't tell externally because again, they all have essentially the cloaca. Um, but when you open this up and you see, you push the fat bodies away and you see these little wormy white looking gummy, uh, you know, swirly structures there, you've got a female. Uh, and so if, depending on what, when the feet, when the frog was harvested, uh, you may even see these black like structures that are going to be these eggs. That's a big giveaway. But if you don't, you'll see these little structures here. Uh, that structure there is the oviduct, right? With the ovaries being up closer toward the chest, which is a little bit different, uh, than our mammal counterparts there. And the males there, uh, really kind of harder to tell there. Uh, with the testes being up close and behind the kidneys, which is really strange if you think about that. Uh, so uh, the reproductive system, urinary ducts there, tubes in a frog that carry urine uh, from the kidneys to, clo to the cloaca, the urinary bladder, the adrenal glands are sit on top of the kidneys just like in us. So the adrenal glands are in the kidneys. Major hormone uh, involved in secreting testosterone. So yes, females do secrete testosterone, even though they don't have testes, and that's because of the adrenal glands. Uh, the over the eggs against the female's major sex cell. Uh, ovaries, again, are the organ responsible for producing the eggs. Oviducts are carrying the eggs. In the male, you have the testes, which produce the sperm. Uh, the sperm is, again, the major male sex cell. And then the seminal vesicles, is uh, we've talked about seminal vesicles. We talked about the earthworm reproduction. Seminal vesicles is uh, the one that's collecting the sperm prior to the cloaca. So basically, any mature sperm are going to be held in the seminal vesicle, ready for uh, ejaculation. All right. So that concludes amphibians. I'm sorry that kind of went a little longer than I wanted to, but that's okay. The rest of it isn't as long as amphibians. I promise. So uh, with reptiles. Uh, again, we're going to follow the classic um, taxonomy and phylo phylogeny, ph phylogeny of uh, the core of evolution where we separate reptilia and avis and birds. Uh, again, recent studies will kind of intertwine these two where they're no longer separate classes because the recent phylogenetic evidence suggests that actually birds uh, diverge from the early uh, dinosaur like reptiles. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, major characteristics of reptiles is they are ectotherm. So again, it's no longer 
appropriate in this point of your school career to call them cold-blooded. Uh, we're really trying to get away from that term. Even in lower grades, they're using endo and ectotherm instead of warm and cold-blooded. And ectotherm basically is the same, it's the same thing, is that they uh, get their warmth, their, their metabolism depends on the environment, right? Uh, reptiles have scales. They have this amniotic egg, which is a huge, huge adaptation, which allowed us to get away from and depend on water. Uh, dry skin, again, we figured out a way to uh, conserve water. And they, again, they have these three chamber crocs, uh, hard except for interesting enough the crocs. So uh, the reptilia here, so again, they can be land vertebrates. Typically, again, there are some, some have an affinity for water, like your crocodiles and turtles and things like that. Um, most have legs, but not all. So the legs aren't necessarily a, a uh, requirement for a reptile. For example, your snakes are reptiles, but they don't have legs. Uh, there are some vestigial legs. You may remember vestigial from our evolution unit. Vestigial meaning uh, a, a essentially a t a snap a snapshot of a time long ago. And so snakes may have like these little microscopic or uh, small pelvic or pectoral girls are where they used to walk or the ancestors used to walk on land, which is kind of to think about. And no, turtles can't lose its shell. So the old uh, uh, cartoon series like Franklin and things like that, no, it's no, that's no good. Uh, there, if you ever uh, do get to see a turtle or see a turtle shell and you are going to put the back, you'll able to actually see the vertebrae are fused into that back toward that dorsal turtle shell. Uh, so the reptile evolution there, odors reptiles go back to the Carboniferous. And so it's kind of nice to see that we're seeing, again, this transition from amphibians to reptiles. And so some of these made these transitions and deviated from the amphibious lifestyle of you know, the metamorphosis of uh, water to land and strictly stayed on land. So we're creating the reptiles there, uh, the age of the uh, reptile there, the Triassic and Jurassic there. And honestly, uh, most people would agree that if it wasn't for the KT extinction, at 65 million years ago, mammals really wouldn't have had their shot because of just how um, incredibly inept and um, that the, the reptiles are at survival. And so again, they're ectotherms, which means they rely on their uh, external environment to control body temperatures, well-developed lungs, three-chamber hearts, just like their nearest kin, the amphibians, well-developed brain and spinal cord. Uh, and so... We're going to see this movement here, and so we went from, again, fishes being completely lateral. Amphibians, we've kind of moved up a little bit uh, to where we're kind of, now we've got extensions where we can come to these push-ups. And now with reptiles, we're rotating it just a little bit further, and we're kind of can do these little, like, army crawl type structures. Like if you've ever seen uh, a crocodile or anything like that, a walk, right, they're just kind of, doing this right here. And then when we get to mammals, we're going to see where the entire pelvic girdle has and pelvic girdle has shifted to where now it's completely underneath our body weight, uh, which allows for lots of different diverse uh, movements in locomotion. So uh, anatomical comparison here. Uh, so again, this is the lobe fin fishes, um, sarcoid there, those, those lump fish there, and you'll, you'll start to see the homology, stru homology structure is there. So here's the pelvic girdle, humerus ulmus radius there. And the primitive uh, amphibians from fossil records, you kind of can see the shift going a little more to under its body weight. And then here we have an extended humerus. And again, allowing us to kind of do this kind of weird uh, like crab -like type walk there. So pretty neat little thing there. Uh, reptile reproduction. Most is internal. So now instead of just having uh, uh, just, you know, the spray and pray, you know, spawning type method, now we're very specific. Uh, so males, again, have a, have a penis there. They're going to insert that into the female's cloaca. Uh, Ovoparius. Uh, so Ovoparius, again, is there. They're going to lay their eggs in a complete shell there, and they're going to leave them. Uh, some are ova viviparous, so they're going to have their eggs inside them, and then uh, they're going to give birth to live young. Uh, so again, this isn't placenta. The egg is, is was hatched in here, and then the snake gives birth to a live snake, which is kind of interesting. Cool. Um, so again, just we talked about there, ovipari, 
eggs are enclosed in the capsule, laid outside, again, like your chicken, like your sea turtles. Ova vivipari, like that snake you just saw there, the snake is uh, hatched, the egg is hatched from inside, and then the snake gives birth to a live snake. And then vivipari, the placental connection, uh, like most mammals are, right? Uh, so here's a major adaptation and advantage that reptiles have over um, their fish and amphibian cousin and pass that on onwards is the amniotic egg. And so the amniotic egg has four major components that I want you to know. The amnion, the yolk sac, the chorion, and amniotosis. So the amnion uh, produces that watery environment around the embryo. So uh, when your water breaks, right, if you're uh, about to have a baby, that's the amnion. The yolk sac is, again, we're very familiar with yolk sac. Have you ever eaten egg? That's the uh, nutrient-rich soak there. The chorion. Located on the outside is going to allow for gas exchange. And if you never hard to think about, we don't really think about it a lot, is in developing embryo, there's metabolic waste that's being produced, right? It's eating. And so if you eat, then you must excrete something that you didn't use. So where does that go? Uh, it goes in the alliantosis, and that little uh, vital compartment there is storing waste so that it's not uh, contaminating the developing embryo and making it sepsis and creating any types of things. So looking here, I'll use this diagram on a quiz, possibly a test there, so you'll want to know that. Uh, and so here again, here's our little chicken egg there. So from the, uh, what would be essentially the belly button there is the yolk sac, right? We just kind of just think about. Uh, from here, we're going to have, um, oh yes, yeah, it's going to be the alliantosis, right? So uh, where we would pee slash poop there. Uh, so this would be any of the waste there, the chorion surrounding, uh, so gas exchange. And then directly surrounding the embryo is the amnion. Okay, so this, uh, this fluid to help it kind of move and swim around there. Uh, and then again, of course, the shell itself. And so the interesting thing about the shell uh, is that the shell is seemingly, it's very, very, like I said, you've probably seen videos of people uh, standing them upright and then you know standing on them, things like that. They're very, very, very uh, structurally sound, but they're also these little microscopic holes and so it's not completely sealed off to allow for gas to exchange, uh, which is very nice and neat. But also, uh, there is a certain size that eggs cannot get. And so the ostrich egg uh, is the biggest one still going on today. But even from fossil records and things like that, eggs really weren't much bigger uh, than the ostrich egg is today. And that's because, again, of the diffusion requirements and limitations for the gas exchange. So they can't get too big or too small. Um, or I should say just too big and too large because otherwise gas wouldn't be able to diffuse in and out for the embryo effectively. So again, just the order of reptiles again. Don't get crazy uh, trying to memorize this. This is just kind of just again, just for your information that we've gone in and that every major reptile uh, has a essentially a specific place. So right, the, the uh, squamata for lizards and snakes, crocodilia, alligators, crocodiles, caimans. Uh, and again, just so that you can see that. Again, I don't want you to focus in on that uh, too much there. So this is just, just some good information. Uh, so how we kind of divided uh, these into orders there. So lizards, again, do not have legs. Look more like snakes. Um, so lizards have legs, cloud eyes, and things like that. Alligators and caimans there uh, are freshwater. Crocodiles in saltwater. Uh, so alligators typically have the more brunt uh, snubby snout. Crocodiles typically have the, the narrower snout there. Turtles, tortoises, uh, and terrapins there. So turtles live in, in, in and near water. Tortoises are completely terrestrial, like the ones on, uh, I just went completely Brent, Darwin's, Darwin's Islands. Oh my gosh. Completely blank. Uh, terrapins there live in the brackish water. Uh, and so again, you have carapace, which is the dorsal side, and plastrion, which is the ventral side. So on the carapace there is where the vertebrae are fused. So again, turtles cannot lose their shell uh, and find other shells to live in. 
uh, ecology of reptiles. So lots and lots and lots of these are in danger uh, because, again, we like to use them uh, for sometimes fashion as in boots or in purses. Uh, not as much today as it was uh, early on, but it's still going on. Uh, conservation is, is going on, ongoing. So, again, a lot of people are – Definitely, definitely terrified. De definitely terrified of you know things like snakes and other types of things. Uh, here all the time, the only good snake is a dead snake, and that's just not true. Um, so again, it's a lot of times these snakes actually do a good thing for us, uh, keeping right mice and rodents and other types of insects and things like that uh, in control, as well as providing food and things for other types of. Uh, Things that you may like to look at, like bald eagles and things like that. Yeah. So, just again, be mm -hmm. wary of that. Uh, of that, everything in the ecosystem does have a a role to play. Um, so, finally, here we get to the evolution of ver birds here, and we've seen this bird before, uh, not in this in this type of form here, this artistic representation. Archaeopteryx, one of the uh, pivotal transitional fossils that we found today, to kind of show evidence that birds evolved from or within uh, reptiles. And so using DNA sequences, actually, so we have strong nodal support to actually suggest that uh, birds came from essentially extinct or nearly extinct lineages within the dinosaurs, which again is why uh, recent classification will actually encompass reptilia and avis together uh, because as you'll notice from this phylogenetic tree here, is that um, excuse me, is that uh, reptiles and uh, birds have a recent common ancestor together, and mammals have a completely different, a completely different uh, living ancestor called the synapsids. Uh, which we derive derive from. So again, that's why uh, recent classification will suggest that uh, that re really reptiles should include the birds uh, because of the DNA evidence. So interesting there. Uh, for again, for this class, we'll just follow the uh, traditional reptiles and avis being the birds. So uh, what makes a bird a bird or an avis an avis? The are they are warm blooded, which we don't again, we don't really say warm blooded anymore, we say endotherms. Uh, they're covered in feathers, uh, and wings. They don't have to necessarily fly, but they have wings. They are their front, uh, from their pelvic uh, pectoral girdle. Hollow bones, a horny bill. Uh, their lungs have air sacs, and we'll talk about how they breathe, it's remarkable. And they have these hard eggshells, unlike a lot of reptiles, which has these softer, uh, these softer eggs there. So, again. Uh, they are endotherms, which means they uh, have a constant body temperature. But because of that, metabolically, they have to uh, take in a lot more energy to maintain that certain body temperature. Uh, covered in feathers, two legs for walking and perching there. The front legs are, or front limbs or wings with most being adapted to flight. Uh, what's interesting is that the in the bird community, they've done such a great job at naming these birds that um, – that this, that this one I should say that this group of uh, animals, the birds, is, is the only animals appropriate. And if I call it uh, a cardinal, a cardinal, that it's accepted and known exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so the general names actually are okay worldwide because there are no other uh, accepted general names for each one. Unlike in the fish. I can call a red eared sunfish, I can call a brim, I can call a panfish, uh, I can call a shellcracker. You know, there's lots of different general names that are more regional on the bird community. It's more uh, accepted uh, that the general name, accepted general name, is uh, sufficient worldwide, which is pretty neat to think about. Uh, so there are a couple of different types of feathers there. Uh, so we have contour feathers, which are going to be necessary for your flight. So that's your flight feathers. You have your down feathers. So again, some of you may have down uh, vest or jackets. So you know that these feathers are vital in providing warmth. And then you also have uh, some animals will have, uh, birds will have these powder feathers, uh, which allows the water to repel uh these uh the water and things like that so not all birds will necessarily have all three of these feathers uh per se but uh but again these are the major three types of feathers uh, so again endotherms there 
So this is a concept that we see a lot, even in the mammal hen there, is that smaller birds had to eat more uh, in relation to its size. So the smaller the animal, animal, the higher the metabolism, the more they have to eat because it takes much more energy to maintain its body temperature. Uh, even if I'm sitting there puffing myself up because of adrenaline or something like that, trying to maximize my uh, airspace, I still have to maintain this body temperature. I have to find more energy, more food, uh, more often than, say, this bigger bird like the bald eagle, where I can eat a fish uh, and be okay for a while. Uh, so again, uh, feeding habits there, they lack teeth, so they don't really chew it. They just swallow it. If you may have seen some videos of them doing that, they'll tear it, and then they'll just kind of throw their head back and kind of just swallow it down the gullet. Uh, and we've seen these two structures before, crop and a gizzard. Uh, many people around here actually eat chicken gizzards and things like that. They're not too bad. Uh, so the crop there is just for uh, enlargement of the esophagus there, so it's just kind of a storage place, while the gizzard is there to help the actual mechanical grinding it down. Uh, and so essentially when we eat chicken gizzards and things like that, uh, again, very muscular depending on how they're cooked. They can also be a little chewy, but that's actually the part of the bird that's actually sitting there and grinding whatever it just ate or swallowed. Uh, down to pieces. Now, their respiration is remarkable to me. Uh, and if you're a musician, you may have heard the term circle breathing. Uh, in essence, that is what birds do, is that they have this innate ability to circle breathe. And let me kind of walk you through that for those who aren't familiar, are not familiar with circle breathing. So birds have a very, very efficient way of in inhaling. And so if you think about it, how can a bird migrate from Canada to Mexico. But think about the energy requirements it would take. Yes, I know they can sit there and hold their wings and kind of soar on these you know, major uh, current lifts, but just the, the energy requirements it would be necessary to sustain flight uh, for that long. And again, we've all, if you've done it, like I said, if you've exercised or whatever, you probably have gotten winded. And the moment you get winded, what starts to happen? When your muscles start to produce lactic acid and it starts to really hurt. And so for birds, not they never really get that lactic acid buildup that we see in mammals in part because of the way that they're able to breathe. And so when they breathe in, they have essentially two different looks. Look at the lungs here. They have two pair of lungs, obviously our pair of lungs, right, right and left. But on top of their lungs or a cell, they have these little air sacs, anterior and posterior. And so when they inhale, air sacs enters the posterior and anterior and sac. Uh, air sacs and then travels through the lungs as it's exhaled. Therefore, the air flows in the air sacs and out of the lungs in one single direction. So essentially, they're able to inhale oxygen and ex exhale oxygen at the same time. So again, that circle breathing that some musicians and things like that can happen. And I can't do it, but essentially, if I could circle breathe, I could sit there and I can have my baritone or whatever instruments I'm playing, and I could play a note literally as long as I wanted to without because I'm able to breathe in and exhale at the same time. So again, a remarkable adaptation that these guys have in that they always have oxygen requirements, which means that they never have to go through the anaerobic process of respiration, creating less ATP and lactic acid buildup. Remarkable, remarkable, remarkable uh, strategy. Uh, indeed, and one that's honestly really unfair. So think about it, if mammals, if athletes had this ability, you can run until literally you just got tired of running, not because you were wore out, but because, like Forrest Gump, I, I want to go home now, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so it's just an interesting idea, uh, an adaptation that birds have developed. Uh, circulation and excretion there, two loop circulatory system, very similar to humans. Uh, ammonia is removed through the kidneys and convert it into high uric acid concentration. So again, it's really neat to think about it, maybe, but again, um, that birds don't necessarily hold on to uh, lots of uh, excess water and things like that, because again, water is really heavy. Water is what, eight, a little over eight pounds a gallon. And so if I had lots and lots of water in me, it'd be much more difficult for me to propel myself up off a tree or off the water or whatever. And so they're able to secrete and maintain a very, very high concentration of uric acid, uh, which they would defecate, uh, which is, again, very, very neat. And, again, similar to their, some of their reptile cousins in Kim there, uh, allows them to go um, 
you know, not necessarily be so dependent on water sources. Um, and again, if you think about you know, some of the migratory birds like around in the ocean, how they're able to go from island to island, uh, even though these islands are miles and miles and miles apart without drinking, is because, again, they're able to um, conserve the water that they did have and eat. Uh, senses there, uh, remarkable senses, in a lot, some cases even better than ours. Uh, see colors very well, even into the UV light spectrum, so we can't see uh, anything outside of light, uh, white light spectrum, so they can see UV, can hear uh, very well, uh, and then, however, their taste and smell are not as developed as in others, uh, no, other animals there. Why they can fly is because of their hollow bones there, so again, if you've ever had a chicken, chicken or turkey leg, Pop it open, you can actually kind of see just what we're talking about, these hollow bones there. Uh, but they're remarkably strong uh, because, again, of the way that they're constructed. Uh, reproduction there, uh, male and female reproductive traits there. Uh, they're sexually dimorphic, or a lot of them are, that you can uh, externally tell the difference between a male and a female. Typically, females are more earthy, drabby in color. And the males had developed, uh, a lot of species have developed these elaborate plumages and colors and dances and things like that, songs, uh, to try to attract the mate. Uh, and so basically the way that birds reproduce is that in flight, a lot of times they'll sit there, here's a female, here's a male, boom, it's done. Uh, and so you may have seen, you may actually probably seen this and didn't even recognize it because it looks like two birds are flying and like they run into each other. Uh, you just uh, witness a bird reproducing. So congratulations for you. Uh, again, eggs and incubation there. Eggs are amniotic, just like we talked about with the reptiles there. Uh, so those four major uh, components there. But unlike uh, a lot of the uh, reptile eggs, these eggs have to be incubated because, again, they have to have this uh, internal, um, this internal, this consistent internal temperature there. So whether it be the uh, male sitting on the egg, like in the penguins, or the female, uh, like it is in most species, there they have to, they have to do that. And then uh, we see a lot of parental care in our uh, in our birds, and this is a reproductive strategy that we've talked about in our ecology unit. Uh, our case strategist where we're not going to make a whole lot of eggs, uh, but whatever eggs we do make, we want to give them the best chance of survival. And so that's just a different reproductive strategy where it's quantity, or excuse me, quality over quantity. Uh, again, ecology-wise, very important there. Uh, lots of pollination. Um, these guys are probably one of the best at dispersing seeds. So they'll eat a seed, maybe of a Bradford pear tree. Uh, they'll go perch in a bigger tree, drop it, and then underneath that tree or whatever, you're going to start to see Bradford pears. Uh, Bradford pears start to pop, you know, spread up and pop up over there. They are remarkable at keeping insect populations in checks. Um, they can migrate. This is crazy to me by the Earth's magnetic fields. So they're sensitive enough to, to know that field. Landmarks, stars, uh, good indicators of environmental health. So one of the pesticides that we used to use uh, several years ago was DDT. Uh, and even though birds weren't necessarily getting sprayed with DDT uh, because of the uh, biological magnification, so as a grasshopper is eating a plant that had DDT on it, uh, 10% of that is now it's more into that, and then a frog eats that, and then a bird eats the frog. Now that uh, bird has been essentially um, introduced to a thousand times what that uh, the, the initial plant was. So again, lots of uh, bald eagles and things were actually dying of DDT, which is why a huge conservation efforts have gone in and uh, subsided the use of DDT in our pesticide and insecticide. Um, um, crop so pretty neat. All right, our last class. So I apologize again for the length of this video. We're almost finished here. So the characteristics of mammals is us. We're endotherms. We talked about that. We all have uh, mammals have mammary glands and nurse or young. And all mammals have hair. Um, so this is the earliest mammal evolution is actually starting around the age of the dinosaurs. So there were some early mammals around the dinosaurs, but they were very small. Um, rodent like what we uh from fossil records and things like that so no big mammals were around during the dinosaur age and the hair 
actually was an advantage because it allowed us to come out at night and us being in the thermos, we weren't we weren't necessarily relying on the sun's temperature to keep our body temperature. So when the big dinosaurs went down or kind of went to a rest area, mammals would come out at night to feed and forage and uh, find each other and mate. And so the first ancestor uh, mammals appeared around the Permian. Again, so they've been around for a while. Mammals have, um, but it wasn't until after the dinosaur, big dinosaurs left, that mammals were really able to diversify uh, in the last 65 million years or so. So again, uh, mammal evolution has taught us that uh, the earth has been together uh, multiple times. You may have heard of Pangea. Uh, so that was a super continent about 65, uh, 60 million years or so, or excuse me, uh, 225 million years ago. Uh, then we've got Gondwana, uh, Laurasia. So a couple of these super continents there uh, that has really helped um, give us an idea of how the earth has changed around. It also explains why I have things such as a marsupial, uh, so like a kangaroo in Australia, but I also have marsupials in South America. So obviously these guys didn't swim across the entire ocean, but they were once interconnected in what is former Gondwana. So a pretty interesting concept there. Uh, so again, so staying warm is a vitally important to animals there. Uh, the hair is is one of the biggest aspects of it, hair and fat. And so again, if we talked about the beauty and the significance of fat, one thing that we didn't necessarily talk about was the fat was also help was to help us to stay warm. And so you have certain animals that have gone on the extreme end, like in your whales and your seals, where they create excess amount of blubber that allows them to swim in the Arctic and live in the, uh, the coldest of the Earth's environment. But also this hair is they have these erector pilii muscles uh, shown here. It just says muscles. Uh, so if you've ever gotten chill bumps or anything like that, that's essentially a vestigial response of these erector pilii muscles contracting and pulling our hair up. And so if we were really cold uh, in our uh, more furry or hairy mammal cousins, then this hair would stand up mm -hmm. to create air pockets and allow the surface area here of uh, – in between the hair follicles to uh, to warm up and helping us stay warm as well. Um, a lot of animals also have sweat glands like us that kind of help us cool off as well. So again, smaller animals will have that higher metabolism they need to survive, so they have to eat more or more often than the larger ones. Um, a very interesting concept here is the closer I get to the equator, the smaller my mammals get. The further away from the equator I get, the larger my mammals get. And again, it's because of this metabolic requirements. So um, if, I'm, if I'm large, I don't have to necessarily eat as much uh, to maintain internal body temperature. Uh, so just a general rule there. So mammals eat about 10 times as much food as reptiles in order to stay warm. So again, that's why you have to feed your dog or cat every day, multiple times a day. And if you have a snake or turtle, you may only have to feed them once a week. Uh, depending on what you feed them. So again, just general requirements based off the metabolic uh, requirements of mammals. We've talked about this already in our evolution talk with the uh, homology between all uh, tetrapods here. So humus radius on a carpal, metacarpals uh, in your birds and humans there. So again, all showing um, and evidence for an ancestral, ancestral relationship. Reproduction is uh, internal for uh, mammals there. Uh, we can divide this in three groups. Oviparous, so there are some egg-laying mammals still around. These are called monotremes. We have viviparous, which is placental mammals, and marsupials. So uh, all mammals, again, have memory glands that help uh, nourish their young. And so some newborns are very, very helpless at birth. They must be cared for. Uh, and so like this marsupial there, I'm not sure if that's a, um, if that's a kangaroo or if that is like a, uh, a, a possum. I'm not sure yet. Uh, others are able to see and walk within minutes after birth, again, depending on uh, their environment. So out in the African safari, after a zebra gives birth, this zebra is essentially able to walk around uh, just a couple minutes after birth. 
So monotremes are the weirdest mammals that we have left. So uh, this is our some old, 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 old animals still around, and these are egg-laying mammals. And it's really nice to still have these mammals in existence today. And it looks like a taxidermist, taxidermist is just weird, especially the platypus here, just a weird, you know, um, creativity. But this animal still exists, and it lays an egg. The same thing with the spiny anteaters. They lay eggs, even though they're mammals. And so, uh, evolutionary speaking, again, it's very nice to know that the ancestor of mammals laid eggs. Uh, because of the former good water, like in, uh, the, in Australia, because the uh, habitat has essentially been undisturbed for such a long time, in the same latitude and longitude, that these guys haven't really changed in the last 200 so million years, and we still get and mammals laying eggs. Again, just a nice little, to me, a transition there. Uh, the reproductive and urinary system open to that cloaca, just like in our amphibians and our reptiles and our birds there. Mono means, again, single opening there. Uh, only, again, three species there, the platypus and two spot, two species of spiny and eater. So we only have three species of monotremes left. Uh in the world, but again, it's, it's enough to suggest and to show evidence for uh, this evolution uh, from the early synapsids and uh, reptiles and, and uh, birds there. So monotremes will lay their eggs and incubate them outside their body just like birds. They hatch in about 10 days, and then again, then they'll begin to feed from uh, the mom's mammary glands. Uh, marsupials there, they give, like kangaroos and possums, they'll give birth to live young, and then they'll complete that development in the external pouches. Uh, so a short time after fertilization, the embryo leaves the mom, crawls into the, the fur there to stay warm, and then it's going to attach to the nipple to nurse. So again, we're familiar with that. Placental mammals are us, and every other animal mammal there, uh, that placenta there, um, is going to give us... Uh, uh, Oxygen and carbon dioxide, so gas exchange as well as waste and other types of uh, nutrients there. Gestation depends on the type of animal and species. It can take anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple years, depending on the mammal there. Um, so don't freak out about the orders of placental mammal. This is not mammalogy class there. Uh, there are many. These are the these are eleven there. There are other orders there, but again, just like in other phylogenetic studies, we've gone through and try to uh, associate similar animals and put them into a specific order. So, for example, like bats or in Chiroptera. Uh, so rats are Rodentria, rabbits, Lagomorphia, uh, etc. So, again, don't, don't concern yourself with that. Uh, don't get stuck down that rabbit hole, per se. Um, but, again, just there. So that kind of concludes the, the study of the evolution of tetrapods. What's the exam going to look like? So you're going to see, uh, so I got a couple of practice exams on the website, aaken.weebly.com. Uh, it's going to be a mixture of multiple choice, some matching, definitely some anatomy sections of the frog. Uh, it also includes the starfish and the arthropods, so it's kind of a large test there. Uh, and as always, I like to have my short answers uh, where you pick the number, you know, uh, up to like 20 points or something. And so you pick the ones that... Uh, that you can get up to 20 points with. Uh, so uh, with that, it's been great. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Again, apologize for the length a little bit. But again, um, it's, been, uh, it's been good. So hope to see you guys soon. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or contact me.